Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Ron, and thank all of you for signing up. It's a, it's an honor. Um, my name is Sandy Steingard. I'm from Vermont, and this is a picture just to, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about social context, so I thought I would introduce start by introducing myself a little bit. Um, so I live near the shores of Lake Champlain, not a great lake, but a really good lake, let's say, and this is it in wintertime, and those are two of my dogs. So that, that's important stuff to know about me. And um, so I started off, uh, I was a very sciencey kid. I studied chemistry in college and, um, and then went to medical school. And in medical school, became very enamored with psychoanalysis. And that's what led me into psychiatry. Um, and that, that's what I saw my residency. But for reasons that I'm not going to go into, I became somewhat disenchanted with that and was at a crossroads at the end of my training um, and went, decided to just spend my time with the people that most interested me and the, who I'd met along the way in my training. And those were people that were, who were experiencing what psychiatrists call psychotic episodes. Um, so that's what I've done. And I've been doing this since the late 80s. Um, I'm kind of at the tail end of my career at this point. But that shift in the context of the time returned me to what in my profession would be called biological psychiatry. Because at that time, the thinking was, my thinking was that uh, these conditions were best understood as brain disorders and that treatment with psychoactive drugs hello, were core to, uh, to the treatment. Uh, but what happened is, um, I, I'm hearing someone talking. Is there someone who has a question? Okay, I'm going to go on. What happened is that I left academia and moved to Vermont in the 90s at a very critical time in psychiatry when a lot of new drugs were released to the market. All of the newer antipsychotics were released at that time. And what I observed through the 90s was an incredible overpromotion of these drugs. And that really began my evolution into what I would call becoming a critical psychiatrist. And a lot of it was based on distortion and distortion that I thought came from uh, the leaders of my profession, academic and um, guild leaders. I would have to say I also entered psychiatry with the DSM-3, the modern iteration, and I've always had kind of a critical stance of that. And, and again, my, the, my career sort of spanned the time when, when diagnoses, modern diagnoses became reified well beyond what I thought was justified by our knowledge. But then in 2011, I read Anatomy of an Epidemic, which had a big impact on me and introduced me to this concept that these drugs might have some long-term harms that I hadn't really appreciated. And from that, I kind of stumbled upon what is largely called need-adapted approaches. So that's my history and kind of why I'm here today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of the synthesis of what I've come to particularly in the last five years, and sort of my reevaluation of the role of drugs, my introduction to need-adapted approach, and what I'm currently thinking of for myself and for others who want to join me um, in, in what the role of psychiatry is. So that's a preamble. So what I would say is, in my view, psychiatry in 2015 is a field that specializes in the prescribing of psychoactive drugs. We do this by categorizing uh, experiences, cognitive, emotional experiences, as illnesses and offer drugs targeted to those illnesses as we've defined them. In the United States, there's this increasing focus on outcomes, increasing push towards using rating scales and algorithms. And I think for the person experiencing all this as a consumer, it can be dehumanizing. I think it also assumes an efficacy for treatments that's not supported by the data. And it places the problem almost entirely within the person. So those are concerns. At the same time, it seems to me that people have and will seek out drugs to alter their mental state, whether in a doctor's office or on a street corner. I mean, this has gone on long in modern psychiatry. So I think it's a good idea to have an area in medicine where people are experts in these drugs and what they do and how they work. And so the question that I'm trying to grapple with myself and will sort of 
offer up today an answer to, you know, is there a way to prescribe drugs and remain humane, to understand the context in which problems arise, and not, and, and, and not accept that all human suffering subsumed under the carrier of mental, of mental illness is best understood within the medical model framework. So the focus today is, hold on a second. Um, I'm going to describe this concept of a drug-centered versus disease-centered model for thinking about drugs. I'm going to talk about how one would apply that to understanding Anti what are called antipsychotic psychotic drugs. I'm then going to shift to talk about the medical model versus need adapted approaches, and then I'm going to pose for psychiatry an integration of these two approaches. So, proposition that's like my first proposition that psychiatry shifted from a drug centered to a disease centered model. And I'm going to explain what the distinction is and how that shift occurred. So a lot of these ideas come from a woman named Joanna Moncrief, who is a psychiatrist in London. She's one of the co-founders of the Critical Psychiatry Network. I think she's quite brilliant, and her thinking has influenced me a lot. So I really want to give her credit for this. So she has written about this and described what she calls a disorder approach and contrasted it with a drug-centered approach. So a disease-centered approach it has the idea that drugs are correcting some abnormal brain chemistry, that the drugs are medical treatments for sort of a specifically defined abnormality in the brain, and that the beneficial effects of the drugs are derived from their effect on this presumed disease process. Whereas a drug-centered approach says the drug is an abnormal brain state that these are fundamentally psychoactive drugs, and that the drugs alter the expression of psychiatric problems through the superimposition of a drug-induced effect. So it's not like they're correcting some core problem, that they're having effects that when superimposed on sort of a certain mental state may be ameliorative. And I'll get specific about that in a minute. Okay, I keep trying to use my mouse, and I have to use the mouse pad. So, just to take a little aside, if you think about alcohol, alcohol is a psychoactive substance. Now, if I go to a cocktail party and I am a socially awkward person, I'm not good at small talk. But if I go to a cocktail party and I have a half a glass of wine, I will feel sort of calmed enough and comfortable enough that I'm able to get by and have a reasonably pleasant time. That's due to the psychoactive effect of drugs, of alcohol, that, you know, it has that effect on me. It has that effect on many, many people. It doesn't mean that I have cocktail party deficit disorder and that the drug is specific to that disorder. We're talking about a generally psychoactive effect. Of course, some people have a lot of trouble with alcohol and, you know, can't stop at a half a glass of wine or go on and misuse it and it has effects on the liver. And those are all you know, those can also be understood in a drug center effect, but the point is the the effect that I find, that I may find beneficial doesn't have to do with, some, it's not because it's correcting some known specific pathology in my brain, it's just, you know, I'm, benefit, I'm benefiting in that instance from this, from this sort of general psychoactive effect that alcohol has. So that's sort of a concrete example of it. So to go further, with a disease center approach, when you're thinking in that way, you're going to think about main effects and side effects. And you think about a drug treating a specific disease, whereas in a drug-centered approach, you're going to accept that these drugs have broad psychoactive effects, which may be useful in some context. In a disease-centered approach, you're going to more likely think about long-term poor outcomes as a consequence of the natural course of some underlying disease state. Um, so, And I'm going to get into the implications for schizophrenia. If someone's on these drugs long-term rather than thinking about, well, gee, maybe this effect of the, maybe this drug over time may have some poor problems, you're going to attribute it to this underlying disease. In a disease center effect, you're more likely to consider recurrence of when you withdraw the drug, you're going to more likely think, oh, this illness that we're treating came back. Whereas when you're thinking in a drug center approach, you're, I think you're more likely to wonder about withdrawal effects. Because most drugs, for whatever condition you're giving to them, have a withdrawal effect. You know, the body accommodates, you take it away, and there's a response to that. So that, again, gives sort of an, 
a reason why these distinctions are important. So what happened? Why did we shift? Um, the, most of the drugs, many, many psychoactive drugs that are still being prescribed today, certainly, you know, there's been a lot of new ones since the 90s, but up until then, many of these drugs were discovered, discovered in the 50s and 60s. And initially, they were thought of in drug-centered ways. So they were described broadly, tranquilizers, stimulants. And then in the 60s, they were rebranded as disease-specific, antipsychotics, antidepressants, etc. And this came about for a lot of reasons, but one big impact was a 19, an amendment to the Food and Drug Act. This is a U.S.-centric talk, so um, sorry, New Zealand, but I think the U.S. has influenced a lot of the world. Um, and so in the U.S., there was an amendment to, the, to a Food and Drug Act in 1962, which was a response to thalidomide, which you've probably heard of. It's a drug that causes pretty horrific birth defects. And when that was discovered, um, they passed this act that required demonstration that a drug worked for a specific condition. That was not required before then. Before then, you needed, there were some safety requirements, but you did, didn't need to show that it was specific, that it worked for a specific condition. The other thing that happened, so let me, one little side light. Um, in addition, the era from the turn of the century, the 1900s through the 60s was a huge revolution in medicine. And it started with um, a very famous American doctor at Influence Around the World who suggested that we need to identify underlying pathophysiology before we can develop treatments. So this goes along with wanting drugs to be identified to a specific treatment that we needed to understand what was the problem that we wanted to fix. And Kreplin, who's a very famous psychiatrist in Germany, applied those principles to psychiatry. And his goal was to begin to understand the pathophysiology of the people in his hospital as a way to develop modern treatment. So one of his innovations was to create an individual record for everyone that came into his hospital. Before Kreplin, you would you know, would be admitted to a mental hospital and there would be a log and it would you know, each person would have a line. It would say the day that he came in and the day he left or the day he died. Whereas Kreplin had an index card, is what I've read, and, and it would be given to that person. And he would collect information about the course of the illness, you know, the history, when it started, what the course was. And his hope really was to collect this, that eventually he, he was a pathologist and he would look at the brains of people when they died and try to figure out what was wrong. Now, along the way, he coined this concept of dementia praecox, which became schizophrenia. And it was a hypothesis that there was a group of people who had this chronic deteriorating course, and those were people with schizophrenia. The problem is that then and now, that has only been a hypothesis, and there is no underlying pathophysiology. But that was the intellectual background that influenced psychiatry in the 60s, what and th this came together with this U.S. Food and Drug Act, which required that there be a particular target. There was a group of psychiatrists based in in um, St. Louis, the Washington University School of Psychiatry, that were phenomenologists and wanted psychiatry to return to a Kreplinian view of psychiatry. And this all came together in sort of reifying this notion that, in fact, there were specific targets for these drugs. The other big influence at this time was the social revolution of the 60s, where there was a lot of use of recreational drugs, um, and it, psychiatry really needed to separate itself for kind of guild reasons from recreational drug. And so identifying these, this collection of drugs as, you know, drugs that treated specific illnesses kind of helped the guild to maintain itself as something other than people that were giving drugs to make, just to make people feel good. And this all, in my view, culminated with the DSM-3, which was really the work of that Washington school um, where we, we labeled specific conditions. We now had this host of drugs that were targeted to them. And this was sort of the final kind of culmination, well, not final, but for that era of this disease-centered approach to using drugs. So 
you know, the DSM-3 legacy, is this, you know, fact or fictive? I think our diagnosis remain hypothetical constructs with the, the controversy over the last DSM-5. Um, Thomas Insel, who was then the head of NIMH, wrote a blog just as it was going to be published saying that the DSM categories are, DSM diagnoses are fictive categories. He wrote, there's no clear, well, I mean, uh, this is my quote, <laughs> there's no clear pathophysiology for any DSM diagnosis, but there's a diagnostic reification that's very common in our culture. It's this illusion that the drug at these specific disease processes. I mean, I think this is what's cons what we have conceptualized as this whole chemical imbalance, um, and it's this completed this transformation, as I said, from a drug center to a disease centered model. It, it's influenced the way these drugs are studied um, and how we've come to understand them. So that's kind of the end of part one. And now I'm going to go through and talk about how this, in my view, has impacted the way that we think about the neuroleptic drugs. Um, so what is a neuroleptic? These are, this is a, I'm using neuroleptic as opposed to antipsychotic as my own personal pushback against a um, disease-centered approach. Um, neuroleptic was a French word. Um, it was a French psychiatrist, Labrie, who first promoted their use in psychiatry. They were synthesized in the 50s. Um, they were used in surgery because they dry secretions. And what they noticed was that they cause indifference. And that, that's in italics because I'm going to come back to that. Um, they And that's why they began to be used in psychiatry because they didn't completely knock people out. Um, they, they, they made them indifferent and they thought that would be a useful tool. So then they were, so they were called tranquilizers, then antipsychotics. In the 60s, we learned that most of them block a neurotransmitter emitter called dopamine. And that led to the dopamine hypothesis of psychosis um, because they blocked dopamine. The idea was there was too much dopamine in the brains of people who were psychotic. They quickly became a, a frontline treatment for psychosis, and then by the 70s, they were recommended for long-term use. So what do the textbooks say? This is from uh, Schatzberg and Nemiroff. You may rec recognize those names if you follow kind of the, uh, the underside of psychiatry. They were both targets of uh, Senator Grassley's campaigns about doctors, especially Nemiroff, who took a lot of money from the drug companies. Um, they, you know, Schatzberg was the chair at Stanford. Nemiroff is current was at Emory and is now the chair at the University of Miami. So these are as mainstream as they come. This is their major textbook. But what do they say? So they say schizophrenia is a chronic condition associated with long-term disability, and that antipsychotics are recommended for long-term treatment to reduce relapse risk. But they also say in normal volunteers. Neuroleptics induce feelings of dysphoria, that's unhappiness, paralysis of volition, not wanting to do things, and fatigue. So again, I talked about a difference, and I'm going to underlie this paralysis of volition. So that would be in a drug-centered approach, talking about what these drugs do to people that aren't psychotic. And again, I will come back to that. So why do we recommend, I'm not going to go into today the efficacy on short-term Treatment, there's a lot that I can say, but I think, you know, I'm just going to sort of assume that they have some role in short-term treatment for now, and if people have questions, we can talk more about it. But for the sake of time, I'm going to go over why we recommend them long-term, because I think this has really important implications. Um, there have been a number of studies uh, called the relapse studies, where people are stabilized in drugs and then withdrawn and then followed over one to two years. And very clearly, and I'm going to give a little data, there's a higher relapse rate when they're stopped. So this is kind of the general um, design. Can, I, I'm going to, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, so what I said, this is like a cartoon. Drugs are stopped, drugs continued. And you see about a 70% relapse rate when they're stopped, 20 to 40%, depending on the study, when they're continued, followed for one to two years. This is from Stefan Lukt, who's a very well-respected kind of not, you know, mainstream guy. He does meta-analysis. And again, and he, he looked at a bunch of studies, 24, you can see over 2,000 people. And again, a 27% relapse on drugs, 
on placebo, big, big difference. But there's another way, and that's where I was taught. That's what every psychiatrist is taught. That's why we continue the drugs. But looking at these same numbers, there's a it's sort of like that picture where you see the young woman or the old lady. There's another way to look at these. 36% do not relapse when the drugs are stopped. You see here, there's 36% don't relapse. And 27% relapse, that's that 20%, even though drugs are continued. So there's really only about 30 to 40% who are benefiting from ongoing drug treatment. The problem is we don't know who's going to be in what group. Um, what happens after two years? You know, people are kept on these drugs for decades. As you probably all know, these are conditions that often start in the teens or 20s. And so when you're talking about long-term maintenance, you're talking about a very, very long stretch of time. So there's some non-controversial problems. Tardive dyskinesia is a movement, abnormal movements, people like chewing movements, finger movements, weight gain, particularly with the newer drugs, metabolic syndrome, particularly with the newer drugs, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, elevated cholesterol, all of these can elevate heart risk. So there's some significant problems that are really not controversial. Karis Myrick, who's someone I admire, who has her own lived experience, currently works for SAMHSA in their Consumer Affairs Division, and um, in, in talks that she's given, she says, what do people want? What, do, what, do, what matters to them? And it's a home, a job, and a date on Saturday night. So what do we know about a job and a date on Saturday night? In particular? What do these drugs do for that? So what I want to say is um, a drug, and this is what I think is really important, a drug-centered approach to thinking about these drugs predicts the findings that we now have on long-term functional outcome. So let me explain what I mean by that. This is from the Finnish Open Dialogue, and at the end of this, this talk, I'm going to talk more about need adaptive treatment and open dialogue. And, and, but in the context of drugs, I, I want to explain why I think this is an important study. This is a way of working with people where, you know, developed in the 80s before it became so concretized in the Western world that drugs were critical to treatment. And they thought that, that maybe drugs are helpful, but they weren't essential. So they started to meet with people. I'm going to talk more about this, but they did not start drugs right away. And they did these five-year outcome studies. And what you hear is in their group, this is compared to a group in Stockholm that had good treatment, but drugs were used in a very different way. And you can see in, in the Finnish group, this is in northern Finland, 29% during the five years, only 29% are ever on drugs as compared to 93% in Stockholm. And at follow-up, only 17% are on drug as compared to 75%. But in in uh, Finland, in this area, only 19% are on disability, as opposed to 62% here. These numbers are very familiar, I would think, to what we see in the U.S., um, and these are just quite remarkable. And, and so how can that be if the drugs are so critical to long-term improvement? So the criticism of dialogue has been that it's, a ra it's not a uh, randomized controlled trial because in this region where they do it, this is the only work that they do. So they have to compare their cohort to another cohort. So what if you do a randomized control trial? So what I'm going to do is talk about two. I have found three, but for the sake of time, I'm going to talk about two because they're more current, where they inform us on the longer-term effects. If you go out beyond two years on drugs versus no drugs. So the first one is from Australia, and it comes from Patrick McGorry's group, which is a very important group. They probably have done the most work on early intervention with antipsychotic drugs, and for a long time, they promoted early introduction of antipsychotic drugs, and they've really pulled back from that, um, in part, I think, because of what they've learned. So this was a study that they were doing that was intended to enhance adherence with drugs. So they offered... It's a small study, but they offered this thing, this cognitive behavioral approach, relapse prevention therapy, um, over seven months, and they compared that to treatment as usual. 
And they found that it worked in the sense that their group was more adherent, and they also found that at 12 months there was a lower relapse rate. That's similar to the other relapse studies. So you take your drug, you're less likely to relapse. However, when they tracked them down at 30 months, and this is what I want to pay attention to, you seem to see a difference when you go beyond 12, 24 months. They found no difference in relapse rate. So that's the first slide I'm going to show you. Um, so it's a little hard to read, but this shows you that this is the, uh, the treatment as usual, and you see a big fall off in terms of relapse. So the, if you have a relapse, you go, you know, this is the people remaining well, remaining unrelapsed. So you see the RPT group is doing okay until you get to here, which is about a 1,000 days, and then they catch up. So really what it looks like is adherence to treatment postpones but does not prevent relapse. So that's one important point. But the second thing is they found that the RPT group had worse outcomes. They had more apathy, lower motivation. They had impairments in social and occupational functioning, and it appeared to be related to adherence. So when they controlled, when they looked at the degree of adherence, that seemed to account for these worse outcomes. And they said in this study, it remains possible that antipsychotic drug medications may be impacting function. So then there's the wandering study. So this was done in the Netherlands, and it got a lot of attention. So what they did was they looked at 128, and these are first episode psychosis, six months of drug stabilization. And then they tried two approaches to drugs. One was maintenance treatment. So they were kept on drugs for two years. And the other group, they stopped the drugs, and then they would restart them as symptoms approved. They published the study at two years saying there was a higher relapse rate, in the drug discontinuation, this is a this stud, this kind of study had done before. Will Carpenter had done this, and and they left it at that. But then they went back and tracked these people down seven years after the study had begun. So it's five years after they ended their two-year program, and they decided to see what had happened. They found 103 of their 128, and again they found just like with Wondering. The relapse rate at seven years was similar. Again, it looked like drug discontinuation delayed relapse and not prevented it. But this is where the money is. They defined recovery. So they, 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 they defined a symptomatic remission, which was no psychotic symptoms, and a functional remission, which is working, having friends, um, living independently. And so to be called recovered, you need to have remission in both those domains. 40% in the drug discontinuation group are in full recovery as compared to 70% in the maintenance group. So those are really big differences. And again, this is hard to see. I'm not going to spend time. It just It's a graph, a survival graph showing again that, um, you know, that the, the relapse is just postponed but not prevented. But this is interesting. So the symptomatic remission, what's interesting is it's pretty similar. It's about 70%, which is what we've always said the drugs do. But the re functional remission rate is, is more than double in the group on intermittent treatment. So there's no advantage for maintenance treatment. You know, you get about the same amount of symptomatic remission, but way bigger advantage on functional remission. So that was a big deal. That study was a big deal. So how do we go back and look at this paradigm of a disease center versus drug centered approach in light of what we we're saying? I was saying that a drug centered approach would have predicted we would have been worried about those results all along. So in a disease centered approach, we're thinking these drugs are targeting this specific pathophysiology. And for many years, the idea was something about hyper a hyper too much dopamine in the brains. In a drug-centered approach, we would say these are drugs that cause indifference. And that indifference may be helpful for certain times when a person is quite psychotic. For instance, if a person is having a lot of ideas of reference and looking around and hypervigilant and seeing meanings and things and is overwhelmed perhaps by terror at that thought to the point that they may be racing into traffic or walking on the streets all night or doing some of the things that people that are psychotic do, a drug that dampens that down may be helpful to that person. 
The dampening down of voices may have to do with the same process, and for some people, that may give that person relief. But it's through the role of difference, okay? Now, when the drugs are stopped, in a disease-centered approach, when the drugs are stopped, we're very comfortable saying that what happens next, when they get psychotic again, it's this illness recurring because we've already decided that this is a chronic and persistent illness. But with a drug-centered approach, we may be more likely to think about what it means to block dopamine. There's a lot of evidence that, that alters the brain, causes the brain to develop more dopamine receptors, and that that may that return of psychosis may have to do with the effects of the drug. And when a disease-centered approach, the long-term apathy, we're going to be more likely to think that's due to this Kreplinian-defined illness that causes apathy, whereas in a drug-centered approach, we might scratch our heads and say, gee, we're giving a drug that causes indifference. Maybe part of the apathy is due to this drug. So that's why I think it's very important and for me really, really helpful to think about these drugs in a, in a drug-centered way and to talk to people about them in a drug-centered way. So that ends part two, I guess, or the, you know, the, the, the sort of first major part on um, drugs. And now I'm going to turn my attention to need-adapted approaches and, um, and basically how I think this has helped me to really embody what we mean when we talk about recovery and, um, and I want to see you, um, but I will pause for a minute because I just covered a lot of material, and I don't know if there's questions. We will have time at the end as well, but if you want to type in anything right now, I'm happy to, um, to take a pause, catch my breath. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's see. I not sure how easy it is to turn on the microphone, right? But maybe somebody can speak or type. Yeah, I'm happy to go on. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. So I'm going to start by just defining what need adapted treatment is. I know there are people on the call that could actually give this talk, so I appreciate your being patient with me. This was developed in Finland in the 70s and 80s, and it originally developed during their phase of deinstitutionalization, they were hoping to get people out of hospitals. And um, Yuri Alanin was a psychiatrist, very influential. Um, he's written a really nice book on this. And basically, as I read him, what he says is, look, in this era, they knew that there were a lot of theoretical frameworks for thinking about psychosis. There were sort of biological frameworks, psychoanalytic frameworks, um, social network frameworks. And they all sort of offered treatments that seemed to be helpful for some people, but it was very difficult to know which treatment, which approach was going to be helpful for which person. So they decided to like to bring the person in with the family and say, just say that to people. You know, like these are different ways of thinking about this, and let's work together to figure out what might be helpful to you. And what happened is that some people got better just by going through that process. And so they began to become curious about what All right, so I just, I just want to go over how these frames are different. Um, so the medical model really focuses on the individual. It, you know, it, the problem is within the individual. Um, whereas in a need adapted approach, from the outset, there's a social uh, frame, you know, looking at the social frame. Um, the medical model is focused on psychopathology, so within the individual. Whereas in a need adapted approach, diagnosis is really held lightly. Um, the, I'm going to run through the other aspect of medical model. When the family is involved in the medical model, it's more as needed. I mean, there are some programs that will really work to bring the family right away, but it's often in a psychoeducation. So the expert has come in, used the expert position to um, find out what the problem is. The expert labels the problem, kind of holds that authority, and then educates both the individual and the family on this problem, on this condition, and how they can be helpful. 
And, um, and the treatments are based on the diagnosis. So you go through this process, um, you know, the process of, of, of diagnoses, and then from that you, you offer the treatments both, you know, with the family psychoeducation and to the individual. They tend to be more fixed and linked to what the expert has determined the problem to be. Um, and they're seen more technological. So in the case of schizophrenia, someone comes in, there's an evaluative process, you know, you get a history, you talk to the person, then the expert says, this is what it is, this is what it's going to be, this is what the recommended treatments are. Um, whereas in a, a neat adapted approach, again, from the beginning, there's a social network approach, people are brought in, you, want, you give a lot of value to what everybody's story is, everybody's perspective, um, diagnosis is held lightly, and the, the expert gives up a lot of authority. You know, the expert has a certain knowledge, but that knowledge is seen on a playing field that's important, but the person's experience, the family's experience is also really valid. Other people that brought in diagnosis is really held lightly, and with that, the whole entire uncertainty of the field. We don't really understand these problems, and we're going to sit together to come up with some understanding of them. And that the treatment, which I put on quotes because it's more kind of as a process as opposed to something done, but it proceeds from the needs of the network. It's flexible, there's psychological continuity, there's a basic therapeutic attitude of respect. Everyone has a valued voice. I mean, we can talk more about what, um, what this entails. I figured I'm talking to a group that are very, really, you're much more of experts in sort of this general approach than I am. So I don't mean to sort of do this out from an expert role, but it, I'm sharing with you how, as a physician, I see the differences and, and, and really how I've tried to shift in, in my, my emphasis. So I have some kind of expertise, but it's not the only expertise. Now, what's interesting to me is to go back and look at SAMHSA. That's um, for our New Zealand friend, uh, a federal agency that has been a promoter of recovery principles in, in mental health in the US. And so on their website, they have these basic recovery principles. And I've been aware of recovery principles for 20 years. Um, but in a lot of ways, I always felt like, again, someone was telling me to just be recovery-oriented, but not sort of telling me how to embody that. And so I've gone back and revisited, and if you look at the principles, you know, these are them. Hope, expect recovery. It's person-driven. You respect a person's values and wishes. You know, for some people, reduction of symptoms may not be the paramount goal. There are many pathways. It's nonlinear. That one or two or three even relapses doesn't mean that a person is chronically ill. It's holistic. It encompasses all aspects of a person's life. It, it brings in the peer support. It's very relational, culturally sensitive. Addressing trauma, talk to people about what happened to you versus what is wrong with you. And then emphasizing strengths, responsibility, um, and respect. And I think, for me, that Learning about need adapted approaches to open dialogue has given me a pathway to become much more of a recovery oriented psychiatrist than I think I was before. That um, those values, I mean, because I think open dialogue is as much a value system and an attitude as a treatment approach. And I think the values really overlap well with recovery, and I think it's why it's been embraced much more by people with lived experience and other approaches. I mean, there's an interesting coming together of groups that aren't always together. Um, so how do I bring all this together as a psychiatrist? Um, to me, the need adapted approaches gives me a vehicle for embracing the humility and uncertainty that I think is the only honest attitude that a psychiatrist can have, given the vast array of things that we really don't understand. I mean, we're here, I mean, to me, it's audacious to be a psychiatrist, to sort of get out there and say you have expertise. And yet I do think there is something that we have that can be of value, and certainly. So, you know, how do you hold that authority that's put on you in an honest way? It allows me, it gives me a vehicle for really listening to what the person wants, 
and values and, and to listen to what the family wants and values and to give everybody a format to talk about what I think are really complex decisions. I don't think this is anti-medication. It's a way to talk about the very fraught decisions about the drugs. It allows many perspectives, I, I just said that, to, be, to come into it. It acknowledges all the limitations. It accepts that drugs are a tool and not a cure. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I'm calling this slow psychiatry. I borrowed some of these ideas from David Healy, who's a very well-known critical psychiatrist. And these are quotes of his that I think are really valuable to me. You know, he wrote, doctors were people you expected would know you and your family and community and would know when to tell a teenager that being lovesick was not an illness or parents and adolescents was not pre-psychosis. They were people who had the common sense to rarely have you on several different drugs at the same time. And we have been swept into a world where, as opposed to being regarded as poisons, they could be tremendously useful if used wisely. Drugs are seen as fertilizers to be sprinkled as widely as possible and begun as early in life as possible. And that brings me to my final slide, this, you know, why slow psychiatry? Well, to me, um, this work sort of brings me aligned with some earlier values about food and industrial agriculture. In my view, these things are all related. So it's an analogy to the slow food movement, which is a movement that pushes back against industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture values production above all else, and the slow food movement values environment, the experience, and the cultural significance of food. And it considers our health in a much more ecological way in the context of our environment and our community. I, I think that there's a role for psychiatry, but I think it's gotten so broad that you know, sort of almost everyone is a potential target for psychiatric treatment. And then there's this outcry that there aren't enough psychiatrists. And then the response to that is to have psychiatrists see people for 15 minutes. Or the current model being promoted by the APA is this sort of collaborative care model where the psychiatrist doesn't even talk to the person. They talk to this intervening person who then talks to the person's primary care doctor. I think that, I, that psychiatrists could really condense who we're seeing. I think that there is a role for psychiatry with psychosis. But when we get involved, I think it takes a lot of time to have the chance to really talk to people, to get to know them, to understand their family and context, to be a member of a larger team, and to just slow it down and then you know, talk about these very complex decision making. So again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And um, I, that's the, the end of the prepare talk, and we have about a half hour for questions. But I think you'll need to, um, I'm going to try again to get online. But um, if you can just say them to me. Yeah. We'll try so, to answer them. I think I was going to read a couple that have already been typed in. And, and Sandy, you can just answer those. Okay. Oh, it looks like you're coming back in. Um, I'm trying. So, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, yeah. why is it so difficult to implement the open dialogue approach in the U.S. for treatment? And then it also says, where can people get clinical okay. help to reduce medication like clozapine? Psychiatrists put you on meds but don't help you get off. Well, I mean, the open dialogue approach is it's, it, it's like the epitome of slow psychiatry because although some of the values are kind of are intuitive for some people, then it does it does mean sort of training people up. And so my commitment, my work in a community mental health center, I'm basically a Medicaid doctor. And I have the great fortune to work in Vermont, which I think is as close to the sort of, you know, social democracies of Scandinavia. We still feel like we have limited resources. And there's other people that have good ideas. So I've just had a heck of a time getting the resources to get people trained. And plus, there aren't a lot of trainers in the U.S. I mean, we're starting to build up. Ed Aldois is um, on the call, and he's one of, you know, he has as much training and as experience as, as really anyone and is an important resource. And, and, you know, we'll be sharing that. You know, the whole Parachute New York City project is a, a manifestation of a, of a need adapter approach in the U.S. And that was a $15, $17 million program in New York City, but Ed, you can comment on this. My sense is it's still, yeah, that's a big city, and, and it, so it's a, 
it's a drop in a in a bigger bucket. So there's just sort of practical, you know, constraints of getting people trained. That's one thing. The second thing is that there's a lot of upfront loading. And so when you're working in a culture that still expects sort of, you know, this spread thin, you know, fertilizer approach to psychiatry to try to retrench and do this deeper dive is hard. Like I sort of have my feet in both camps and um, it, you know, not, I don't want to like present as being sort of a martyr, but like a lot of these family meetings I do are in the evening and there's just, you know, there's just like a certain amount of time it, and logistics that, that you can do. So it's, those are problems. I mean, I think there's movement. We're going to be having a meeting in early June of people around the country that have been um, trying to do this work. There's a big grant to support training in Atlanta at Emory and a community mental health center. Yeah. All right. That's what it was. Okay. So Cindy asks, I'm interested in strategies to begin the conversation about moving the conversation and services from disease-centered to drug-centered. So how to get going with those kind of conversations. You mean like when you're working with an individual? Is that what, like how to, like in clinical practice, how do you do that? Yeah, I, um, I guess you just have to, going to have to interpret that question. Well, Cindy can speak up. Okay. Well, I mean, I just say it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to be honest with people and tell them what I think and about diagnoses. It's, it's hard. I mean, that's why I like having the time to be able to do that with people because it takes, um, it's, it's a process and, and people don't always hear what you're saying the first time. I mean, you guys probably all know this because um, that's why, why I blog. I mean, I write a blog on Man in America and I talk about all this. Um, I give, you know, I've talked a lot here and, you know, I do, you know, when you talk about the role of expertise, I feel like I do have an idea that I'm using the expertise given to me to give up the expertise, if that makes sense. That there's a, you know, I've come to accept that there's a certain authority that I've been given and to whatever extent anyone's willing to listen to me, I'm going to use it to give up the authority. <laughs> But I, I don't really know. Like I mean, it, there's a, I, I, I have, you know, I have moments of optimism because there does seem to be some shift. But then I have moments of feeling that, you know, the power structure is so big and powerful. And people love sciencey things. You know, I think that I'm not anti-science and I'm not anti-neuroscience, but I kind of, I've gotten to a point where I got it, I kind of get annoyed that, like, people will talk about some really cool work, and then show a picture of the brain, and that legitimizes it. I think there's a real misunderstanding. That's going to be like the next thing that I write about. I've written a couple blogs, you know, do we need to see inside the box? But I see it a cultural way. You show a picture of some area of the brain lighting up, and despite the fact that these studies are really suspect in terms of replicability and all this stuff, people just love it. And I, I think you know, we're just, you know, I, I don't have any illusions that I'm able to, like, stand up to that. <laughs> I'm just sharing my own frustration. I, I, I totally appreciate it. Um, so holistic um, mental health, somebody typed in, many are concerned about risk and safety. They are not comfortable with uncertainty. Medication seems safer and certain. How do we help with that change of thinking? Well, believe me, I mean, this is kind of where I live every day in that, um, you know, I've been a couple things. I do work with people that are in the midst of a psychosis, and I am worried about their safety. And I've seen bad things happen to people. And so, you know, I'm honest. I, I commit people to hospitals. I participate in the course of system of care. I like to think that I participate in an honest way. So some of my colleagues might go to court and say, you know, delaying treatment is bad for the brain. I will not say that. I talk about the drugs in a drug-centered way, but sometimes I'm in a position where I feel very, very worried about a person's safety, and I and because the authority is on me, like if I, you know, there are errors of omission and commission, I do make these decisions. They are difficult, difficult decisions. 
but I at least try to do it in an honest and transparent way, and I don't try to hide behind the disease model as an excuse that I'm doing it for their own good, because I do understand that there are hazards on all sides of the occasion. Now, I've also been tapering. I, I, I have five years of data now. I've, pub, I've not published, I've blogged and have presented up to four years. And so I've, and this has been inviting people that are stable on medications to taper. And I've been tracking it. And I'll tell you, some of, there have been seven people who with slow tapers ended up in the hospital. One after tapering for years, and the hospitalization was a year long. And, you know, this hangs on me, you know, with a lot of heaviness. And then I've had people who stop them abruptly, but I have to be honest in saying that the decision may have been influenced by my open and transparent decision about my ambivalence about the drugs. And abrupt discontinuation almost uniformly is associated with hospitalization. And I don't take that lightly. In fact, one psychiatrist in Vermont said to me that I'm responsible for the increased rate of assaults in the psychiatric hospitals in the state. I mean, I don't think that's true. Vermont is a very small place. I've been fairly vocal about this. I think that's what she's talking about, that it's in the ether, you know, that there's a psychiatrist who talks about the long-term problems with the drug. So uh, it's a tender discussion, but again, bringing everyone in the room, having transparency, talking about all the different fears and harms in an open way. So I just, and one of the things, because I do, you know, converse with people that really, really hate psychiatry and hate coercion, and I do try to engage with them. And what does get me frustrated is the lack of acknowledgement that there are risks for some people in these states, and that, that, that even, you know, that, 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 you know, what I get sometimes in my blogging world is, if only you were good enough, or only you were kind enough, or the dignity of risk, or, you know, let the person freeze on the street in the winter. And there are just certain limits for me, but it's never easy, and it's never trivial. So that's a very long answer, but it's such an important question. Say hi. No, I was just saying hi to him. Yeah, a friend sounds of mine really important. Um, another <laughs> one says, yeah, oh, sorry, if somebody's going to try to say something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, where can people get clinical help to reduce medication like clozapine? And no, somebody's saying and psychiatrists I mean, honestly, put don't, you on meds but don't help I you get off. And obviously, you it sounds like you do help, but um, everybody great, can't go to so Vermont, I probably. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Man America has a lot now of people that are, you know, clinicians that are open to this way of thinking. I would say with clozapine, to be careful. You know, there's a couple of drugs where historically there's been a thought that clozapine might be more likely to prime the brain to what's called supersensitivity. Um, and certainly with abrupt discontinuation, I've seen people get really, really sick. So I've been very cautious about clozapine, but I have to say in my tapering group, and I'll be recording, reporting this, I now have a few people that are doing really, really well getting to low doses. So far, none have come off because I'm doing it so, so slowly because these are people, you know, in a couple instances are working full time, have had very, very robust recoveries, um, but we've been able to reduce to like a sixth of their previous dose, but we go down slowly. So I do recommend that you be careful with clozapine, and I do recommend being careful with lithium because of the seven people, and now there's an eighth who, um, who went into the hospital, 50% of them had some reduction in lithium. The eighth uh, stopped abruptly, not under my supervision, so that's in a quasi area. But it's been long known that reduction, discontinuation of lithium is tricky. Um, so, and I think that in my experience, a manic psychosis is really, really tough. And what's happened with me is I lose the entire relationship. So I'm working with someone over years having these discussions. And then something happens, and it's like, in some cases, 
as if we've never met. The entire relationship is gone. And then you have someone acting in a way that can be risky, that's alarming to the family. People appear to be in harm's way. I mean, I've just seen a few people really, you know, and then come out of it and, and regret it. So, you know, those are stories that are a part of my life that I can't ignore. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I think you're right that sometimes it's really hard for some people to appreciate well, I mean, the risk that, that you face because maybe they're thinking of their own sorry, story Ron. where they didn't. In have, my own there practice, wasn't that I still have some people where they don't appreciate that other things happen. We have and a Cindy's different asking, appreciation of the current risk, and so you know you could you might you might end up having someone who is in treatment with me who says. She doesn't practice what she preaches because, and then tell you a story that will sound compelling. I might not tell you, I might not be able to tell you a story, but if I told you a story, I might shade it in a different way. And that has to do with this challenge that we have, that people have different views. And, and so someone's own view of what was happening may be very different from the perspective of the treatment team, of the family, and, and, and that can be a very difficult thing to reconcile. You know, what I did wasn't risky. You're wrong. You know, and a lot of times you're intervening before the bad thing. You're making an assessment, and obviously that's very, that's an approximation. We're very bad at predicting dangerousness, so you're just, you know, it, it's, it's tough. I think, you know, these are tough decisions. I'm seeing a question, how do you see shared power being in relationship with open dialogue? Uh, to me, shared power is, is a core principle of open dialogue, that you, there is no one who holds the power. Now, you need to give that up actively. And even like Brigitte Alacare, who was the chief psychiatrist in the hospital there, who's a really wonderful person, a chief psychiatrist, I mean, she's talked about being a doctor in the room, you sort of have to work extra hard to give up the power. But it's very much, to me, an embodied principle of, of what open dialogue is. Yeah, well, Cindy was asking, I wonder I how know. you I mean, do it within systems. You, the message <laughs> needs to get to psychiatrists, I mean, which change. are in control you know, of many you guys services. You've a lot of great work where you are. But anyway, I, I, Cindy, um, I, I just have had conversations that make me feel that there are people that have a real capacity to influence well beyond what I do that are hearing this message. And I think you've been an important part of that. Right. Notice Cindy says, I really appreciate your humility. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to ask a question um, um, verbally right now, or you can also uh, type something in. Meanwhile, maybe I'll ask a question. Um, one thing I've noticed about um, the drugs is that they're very easy to start and then hard to get off and yeah. you know um, so people um, you know can have often an effect pretty quickly oh the voices are giving me a terrible time I talked started this drug they aren't giving me such a bad time anymore but then when it comes around to get back off all of a sudden it's like really hard and the person hadn't anticipated that how do you make sure that that thinking about, hey, this might be not so easy to get off, or maybe we should try something else first. How do you get that out there? Well, what I did talk about today for the sake of time is this whole question of duration of untreated psychosis. And um, I'll just try to summarize it quickly. But in the early 90s, so this is an important time, because here you have, in Finland, they're starting to say, let's see if we can work with people and hold off on using drugs. And their research protocol early on was to give it six weeks. And they had this cool scale called Grip on Life Scale. I kind of like the name of it. But the idea of they didn't see someone really kind of 
getting back into life um, in six weeks that they would introduce medications. And so that was an important time because at that time, there wasn't sort of a concrete professional idea about delaying treatment. But this guy named Richard Wyatt, who was a very major psychiatrist at National Institute of Mental Health in the US, wrote a really influential paper in 1993, and it raised this question, is psychosis bad for the brain? And he looked at a bunch of studies, many of them going back to when the drugs were first introduced, and he compared the groups that like weren't on them with the groups that were, and he said there, he thought that there was evidence that delaying treatment led to worse outcomes. Now, that took hold and it became a hypothesis went to a factoid, you know, sort of a tightly held belief that we know that delaying antipsychotics is bad for the brain. And it led to a lot of these early intervention studies. So McGorry started his work in the 90s based on let's see if we intervene early with drugs. Will that improve outcomes? And he's been doing that now for a bunch of years. And as I said, he's really backed off from that. Now, what's really interesting, and I didn't present it today, one of the studies that he cites is a study from England from the 80s, where they did one of these studies for two years. You know, They did this initial study, and they had some people, they stabilized people for a month, and then a group was randomized to no drug, a group was randomized on drug. And they reported their initial findings saying that the group off drug um, did worse, had more relapse. And then what they did is they looked at the group that had been ill for a long time before they got into treatment versus the group that had been ill for less than a year. And they found that the outcomes are much, much worse in the group that had been ill for a long time. And that was one of the studies that he cited to say delaying treatment is not good. But that group went and looked at functional outcomes in, at 30 months. And they found that the group, looking at the people that were ill for less than a year, the group that was taken off drugs did better than the group that was on drugs. Now, the group that had been ill for a long time may have just had a different kind of problem, because there may be something different about a kid who's a little odd and awkward and sort of out there but not coming to the attention of services for maybe 10 years versus someone that has kind of a florid onset of something. But it's funny that Wyatt never even cited the second paper. So anyway, when I started to look at open dialogue, I really needed to reckon with this issue of duration of untreated psychosis. It wasn't something addressed, let's say, by Robert Whitaker. So I went back and looked at that literature, because I thought, how can I say to people, let's hold off, if that's bad for them? And I can't cite it, but all I can say is there's a lot of data, not a lot. There are some studies that say, yes, Early intervention does help outcome, but it can be early intervention with psychosocial interventions. It does not need to be drugs. And touching a person and holding them early can improve the outcome. And that has given me enough assurance to say, when you can, you know, when it's not someone who's really making it impossible for people to live with them or is out there doing dangerous stuff, and there's a lot of people that can come into an office or you can go to their home and you can work with them when you can. Give it some time and see if you can kind of work with them and see if you can get them to come out of it because you're right. Once you start the drug, you're never really sure what's the impact of the drug or not. Now, with that being said, I have seen people who have been on drugs for a long time and have been very successfully able to discontinue Ron Coleman, who's very active in the Hearing Voices Network, who tells his story, so I feel like I can say this, was in and out of all medicines for a long time, like 10 years, has been off them for a very long time. And he once said to me, he thinks there's sort of a 10-year period where things can be very rough for people, then later they settle down. And I think I'm beginning to see that with some of the people in my protocol who are being pretty successful in this slow taper. Some of them are doing extremely well feel like they're thinking clear, think, you know, losing weight, you know, all the things that you're hoping for as you reduce these drugs. Great. Yeah, I think John Bola did a study where he, or a survey of all the studies that where somebody started with psychosocial rather than drugs right away and showed that it didn't seem to, it seemed to work fine. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think, you know, as I said, my McGorry's backing away, and they're, you know, 
I think it probably varies from place to place because they have this big national program called Headspace, and I think it varies according to the psychiatrist there. But I was just in Australia and traveling all over, meeting with a lot of these people and talking to them. And I know that there are people that are very sympathetic to this perspective, although you know it's a big country and I'm sure there's a lot of variability. So if anyone wants to speak, you might have to click to share your microphone again after I had turned off the sound earlier, but I think it should be possible. Anyway, you see Holistic Mental Health Network says just we appreciate your open, honest sharing. Stay in the work. And then also there's a this, import, this important work is getting set aside and not funded due to the opiate, her, opiate heroin epidemic. And so that was an idea. Um, because the opiate heroin epidemic in part came about through the same processes that led to you know vast uses of medications. I mean there's a book called My Daily Meds. It's older, Melody Peterson, a New York Times reporter, and she talks a lot about this, but she has a chapter about I think it's Purdue Pharmaceuticals and how in the 90s and early 2000s they heavily, heavily promoted the use of opiates for pain. Pain became the fifth vital sign. Um, and this was all a, st a commercial strategic effort by these companies. And look what we've wrought, you know, and now we're, you know, creating another industry. I mean, my, I, this is very true, and it's true in Vermont. My agency is very deeply into medication-assisted treatment. So I, I don't know if it's one versus the other, but certainly the story of how we have developed this recent epidemic is also a story about pharma. And, and the way it's co-opted American medicine. Can people hear me? Hello? Anybody want to speak? Yeah, I just want to, I'm, yes. this is Ed down in New York. Yeah, I, um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank you for starting this conversation yeah. because I think you're having a new way of conceptualizing how medications interact with experiences people are having or symptoms is really important because otherwise, there's not much to go on if we're, you know, what's the alternative beyond thinking about things as diseases and needing to use medications long term. Um, and just to have some language around that, you know, and how does that fit into this more open approach and social network approach, you know, I think is really important because it's, you know, on Parachute, we've, we're getting to the point now where we're able to you know, and one thing I would add is we're to be able to speak more openly about the medications. And I think one of the reasons I just wanted to add in there as far as this question around shared values, I mean, um, shared power, is that we're getting to the point, like on my t the team in Queens, where people aren't so anxious when someone wants to reduce or someone goes off suddenly or we meet someone and the community who's not taking medication, like we're able to go in and still engage and not narrowing in on the focus of, well, are you going to take your meds or not? We're at the point now where we're still able to, some members of the team who think we're able to keep it open and that not be the only focus. And I think it comes from having the experience of offering something that's, that's seemingly, that's important and can be powerful in containing and holding that family or that individual or that network. But they kind of go hand in hand. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, I mean, I think that um, they do go hand in hand. And I, I guess one of the things that I want to say when I'm with, like, the open dialogue crowd is I don't want to forget about the medications because we don't know what the ingredient is to the yes. good long-term outcomes. And I think that if we as wonderful as the principles are, and I'm very dedicated to them, I think if we don't look at the way we're using drugs, we may not get yeah, not the same kinds of outcomes. So yeah. it goes hand in hand. And, and you, know, I, I, you know, I think I are, yeah. are really in agreement. I, I want to just comment, there's a question, I'm clearly seeing the devastation resulting from putting so many kids on stimulants. And, you know, I think what gets lost in the whole stimulant story is that Stimulants were used in rats to model psychosis. And, you know, in addition to the whole kid thing, what I've seen in the past 10 years is this huge explosion of, you know, so-called adult ADHD, which is just another story, like the opiates and everything, of marketing 
because a lot of the antidepressants, uh, a lot of the psychiatric drugs are off-label, and so there's a bunch of stimulants because of needing to package them in a way to keep people from shooting them up are on patent, and then you see this huge explosion in uh, stimulants for adults and people not even having a conversation about, uh, you know, the deleterious effects of these drugs. I mean, in a, in a different iteration of this talk, I have a whole section on the stimulants and looking at the stimulants from a drug-centered to a disease-centered approach. And, you know, now you'll see stimulants being talked about to treat major depressive disorder, binge eating disorder, um, and these are all, this is all a, a disease-centered approach when, in fact, we know these are drugs that are alerting, we know these are drugs that are, that suppress appetite, and we know these are euphorians in the short run. And this isn't a surprise. It's bizarre that this would even make it into a journal, but we are not talking about what it means to be on these drugs for a long time, and we're putting kids and young adults on them. And I, this is something, obviously, you can tell. I'm always called passionate. I have a lot of passions about this because I'm worried. I'm really worried about what it means to our culture. Yeah. Well, it looks like we've kind of come to the end of our time. Um, so Sandra, yeah. I just want to really thank you for coming here and um, joining us and sharing what you have to share. Um, if anybody else wants to speak any final words or anything. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, it's an honor. I appreciate you all giving up your busy time. And to my friends out there, I look forward to seeing you all soon. <laughs> thank you, Ron. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sandy. We could, could do it. Um, so.